Good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County. The Professional Service Group of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody that is in any kind of career transition. And uh, in addition, happy Aloha Friday. Uh, those of you who know me know that I do wear my Hawaiian shirt each week for Friday. Uh, whether I'm here or not, I do wear my Aloha shirt on Friday. So I like to wish everybody Aloha Friday. It is casual Friday in Hawaii, so why not celebrate with them? And also, happy Cinco de Mayo. So today is Cinco de Mayo, and it celebrates a uh, victory of Mexico over the French in their uh, Mexican-Franco War. I believe that was in 1862. So it's a celebration of Mexico. You may want to uh, visit your favorite Mexican restaurant today or this weekend, assuming you can find a table because they tend to be quite busy and celebrate with your favorite Mexican fare. So we will celebrate that as well. The Professional Service Group of Mercer County is here to provide you uh, information and support, a little bit of guidance to help you be more efficient with your own job search. So we don't uh, provide you jobs and we typically don't guide you directly to jobs. But as you are doing your own job search, you want to be as efficient as a, and effective as possible. And so we hope uh, by providing our uh, resources that you will definitely become more effective in your own job search. We do have lots of resources for you in our group, in addition to our weekly meeting, and we are here just about every Friday. We do have a LinkedIn group. So I do encourage you to go find and join our LinkedIn group. Our LinkedIn group is called PSG of Mercer County. So uh, LinkedIn is the uh, number one site for uh, business to business communications and also uh, a very uh, big site for job seekers as well. You'll find a lot of people uh, in business probably at the companies you're looking at uh, on the LinkedIn. And so you'll wanna uh, be in our LinkedIn group our LinkedIn group does give you access to over 1,700 members in our group. So even if you don't have 1,700 first degree connections, by being in our group or any group for that matter, those people become kind of functionally first degree. You can reach out to them through the group and contact them. So in your job search, you may want to, uh, you may find a company and a person in our group who's at that company. You may want to contact them. And then what will happen, you could just contact them through the group. Hey, can you help me learn a little bit more about the company? I have interest, whatever that is. Now, what's nice about our group is um, we don't let just anybody in. We let just you in. Uh, when you join our group or click the join button, we put you in the pending status. And each week we are looking for people that do request to join. And then we look at our attendance, whether you signed in on the laptop or on our paper or through our meeting online because we will only accept people into our group who've been to at least one of our meetings, which means these are people that are serious about job hunters. We're trying to keep the, the sales people out, the list collectors out. Now, if you're a salesperson, we're not keeping you out, but people that are just joining for their own sales uh, purpose and growing their own email list. And there's a good chance because they are serious about job search that if you reach out and contact them, they will probably contact you right back. So very good to join our group. For that reason. In addition, we do have our um, website. It is psgofmercercounty.org, psg uh, at mercercounty.org, and uh, psgofmercercounty.org. Uh, so um, it is more than just a landing page. It is over 120 pages of web content. It's a tremendous amount of information that we have. So go take a look at our website. Uh, we do have a page right from the menu, access from the menu called resources. You may want to click on that. There's a whole list of resources that are there. It's two columns with icons and links. And uh, of the resources we have, we have links to 16, 16 other groups that are like this. You may like this group. You may not like this group. Every group is different for different people. You may want to join an additional group, find an alternative group, that's fine. There's also uh, 32 other career resources which includes other organizations or agencies, even state organizations from New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. So we have those career resources for those states. We even have one personal wellness site and one mental health wellness site as well, mental health site as well. So um, go take a look. There may be a, a link there, an organization that you'll want to uh, visit and get some benefits. 
our website isn't the be all and end all for job search websites, but it may be a good starting point for you and it's a resource for you to use. So uh, our ground rules are uh, pretty simple. We do ask for those of you virtually to uh, keep your microphone on mute until you do want to engage with John and John does have an engaging presentation today. Those of you in the room who do have a question, we ask, please, if you don't mind, come up and use the microphone and use it like a rock star, keep it right up to you so we all hear. And the reason why is we wanna make sure the virtual people hear your question as well. If you're in the middle or back of the room and you ask the question, John, I'm sure we'll hear it, but the people virtually won't. So just uh, uh, speak through there. And um, for those of you virtually, um, you could ask your questions through chat. Chat is a little icon, it's either a square, a circle, a little tab at the bottom, and you'll use that to, um, leave a question and if you do that through chat write the word question in front of it because a lot of people are going to put other information and for those of us who are going to be monitoring the questions and answers we don't want to miss your question it says question we know virtually you have a question um, or you may simply unmute yourself and say excuse me john i have a question no different than here if you raise your hand and come up to the microphone and john will uh, take the question when he feels it's appropriate Okay, so those are our ground rules. Otherwise, you will keep um, your microphone on mute. And with that, PSG of Mercer County is very pleased to welcome and welcome back John West Hadley. John Hadley helps job seekers who are frustrated with their search. After graduating from Stanford University, John worked in the financial services industry for 25 years in roles ranging from product manager to chief actuary. He then opened a successful consulting practice which generated over two and a half million dollars in revenue. Two decades ago, he started his career search counseling business. He has helped hundreds of professionals land the job and pay they deserve. John is a popular speaker and author on career and career search topics. In addition to editing and writing for leadership and development magazine, The Stepping Stone, John publishes his own career tips email newsletter, bringing over 9,000 subscribers, expert advice on marketing yourself for a career search. And to find out more about John, you can go to his website, jhacareers.com, and we'll post that again later. Actually, it's online right now on the screen. So, PSG of Mercer County is always pleased to welcome the job search strategist, John Hadley. <laughs> Tom came to me when he'd had 15 months of a steady stream of interviews and never a single offer. A week after my winning interviews program, he was weighing two competitive job offers, one of which was actually higher than the posted salary range. So I'm hoping that today we can help you improve your interview skills and get to that sort of, that sort of place. My agenda for today is we're going to take a few minutes to talk about what you're most worried about in the interview process. Make sure that we're hitting the right, the right points. Um, I'm going to share my Homer template for how to hit a Homer in interviews. But the, the core of this is going to be mini role plays. I'm going to ask people to participate in just you know, really short little bits to illustrate different points for, that can help you in the interview process. And now I guarantee what's going to happen is everyone's going to sit back and say, oh, I, you know, I don't want to be the one who does that. But it's like watching um, the difference between watching a, a workout program and actually doing the workout program. This is how you build your muscles in a safe environment where, you know, it's there's nothing at stake here. You're not on you're not going to not get an offer because you blow it. You're going to learn how you can navigate some of the trips and tricks and traps. So, uh, as David mentioned, I have this career tips newsletter. I'm going to hand out a sign-up sheet for anyone out here who's interested. And you know, I have I also created a series. It's called um, Building Influence. It's one short email a day for for about for per business day for about two weeks. So anyone who signs up for career tips today, I will also send you, I'll put you on the list to get that series called Building Influence, which is all about building influence in critical meetings like interviews. So, 
So let's talk about what worries you the most in interviews. And those of you who are um, on the screen, you know, you can put it in the chat box and David will share it with me, or you can unmute yourself to tell me. But what are you most worried about in interviews? Anyone? Any 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 things that that trouble you, that you find difficult, that trip you up? Yes. The recall of information that you do know, but on that moment you don't say exactly what you know. Or how right. said it. So recalling things on the spot, which I mean it's a an interview is a tense situation. It's often we have brain parts. And we, you know, something that seemed like it was, you know, so we prepared, we're we're all set, and we just our mind goes blank. Or what often happens is it's just that they've asked the question a little differently from what you anticipated. And so you don't you don't recall, you don't, you don't make the connection. You know, Alex will probably remember a time he, he and I used to run a group called CMG up in uh, Basking Ridge. And we did a night where we did mini interview role plays, kind of like this. But basically, I got up and shared a technique. And then we did mini role plays for people to practice it. And one of the very first ones we did was I, I, I showed a technique for how to answer, tell me about yourself. And then I went around and, you know, watched what the, everyone was doing. And there's one person who didn't do what I had just shown. And I said, I, I don't understand. What, tell me, what, why didn't you use your hero story? She said, well, because that's not the question they asked. Because I had different variations on some of them said I, I had them pick it out of a out of a hat. Some of them said, tell me about yourself. Some of them said, tell me why you're here. Some of them said, why should I hire you? But they were all chances to tell your story. But because it wasn't exactly the way she anticipated the question being asked, she didn't put it together and didn't use it. So that that happens a lot. One of the one of the great things you can do. Um, if you have a brain fart, what is to ask a clarifying question? Because it gives you a few moments to, to, to think. And often, particularly if it's something where I've just misinterpreted what I think they're asking, when I ask the clarifying question, suddenly as they're telling me what they mean, I'm like, ah, yes, now I, now I make the connection. And, and sometimes it's just as simple as, I'm sorry, you know, I just, I had a, I had a brain fart or, you know, whatever language you'd like to use. Can we come back to that in a minute? And just, and we're all human. Interviewers are human too. They know that this is a tense situation. So if you have to do that three or four times in the interview, I'm going to be very concerned. If you have to do that once, I'm, I'm going to understand, particularly if you come back later on with a really strong answer. Okay, what other what other issues? What we have one in the uh, the chat, John. Okay. Speaking of what you were just talking about, the person is asking, tell me about yourself. What is it really about? Ah uh, tell me about yourself. Well we will actually get into that um, when I get to when I start going through the, the template. So we'll come back to that one. We'll definitely hit that. What else? What else bothers you in interviews or trips you up or you're worried about? Yes. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, dealing with age differences. Dealing with between, age. between me and the interviewer. The unasked question, answering it. Uh, how do I convince the individual that, yes, I'm older than you, but my technique is as good as yours? I'm up to date with current. Thanks. Wow, we could do a whole workshop on that. I know, uh, I know, Marty Latin's done workshops on that a lot. Um, I mean, the the short answer would be that um, I mean, we can't we can't change how old we are, so we don't even try. But you try and deal with the other issues that are going through someone's mind, because a lot of times what we perceive as an ageism issue is really that 
I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm worried you're not up on technology. I'm worried that you're stuck in your ways. I'm worried that you don't have the energy. I'm worried that I'm going to have to pay you too much. I'm all these other things. And so you figure out how can I address those in a natural way in the course that I show I'm really up on technology, that I show that I have energy, that I show that I have passion for the work, that I show that because of my expertise, I'm going to be able to do this job at a much higher level, be much more productive than someone younger. And, and, if, and so I try to show that and demonstrate that through everything I do. Now, if it truly is ageism, I'm not gonna get past it. Um, if it, you know, this person just has in their mind, I'm never gonna hire someone older, but there are a lot of people who I will get past it with. And I'm just not going to worry so much about the others. So, I, and I'm also going to make sure that I look that that I look youthful, that I don't have out of date um, an out of date suit from ten years, twenty years ago. That I don't have glasses that look like they were, you know, put. I got them in the '70s. That I have a current hairstyle, all this sort of stuff, because those can trip you up too. You know, I also remember Laura Goddard. Uh, uh, who ran that group with us, she used to tell the story of a guy who came to a job search group like Ben that she was in. And he shows up and they had Linda Trignano, who's a you know, personal appearance expert and, and career coach. And she was giving them all pointers. And she, she looks at him and says, okay, you need to change your hairstyle. Your glasses are really out of date. She's pointing all these things out. The guy got offended in a, and left in a huff, never came back to the group. She runs into him a few months later, and he, he'd been looking for at least six months at this point and getting nowhere. She runs into him a few months later, he's landed. He has up-to-date glasses, a current hairstyle. He, he, had, he had taken it to heart, even though at the time he was offended by the comments. Um, what else, any other? We got a few more in the chat sure. also. First one is, why did you leave your last role? Why did you leave? Okay. I'll just make, make a list and we'll make sure we come to these as we as we go through. Next one is how did you how do you get it to be a conversation rather than an interrogation? Great, which is the core of a successful interview. And we'll we will be hitting that directly as we go along. And the third one is I don't have the certification or degree, but I have a massive amount of experience with the required skills. Okay. Uh, let me let me hit that one quickly because I don't think I had that um, anywhere in, in what we're going to talk about. Um, there's part of this is being really confident in what you bring to the table and what you bring despite what's there. Part of it is also really using your network as much as you possibly can. Because if I first am just meeting you and I like you and I say, oh, Patty's really interesting. She's a great person. I wonder if there's a way we can make this work. Then the fact that Patty doesn't have the particular certificate or degree, I'm open to the argument that she has lots of expertise that will make up for that. In fact, someone uh, I was working with years ago, he had a conversation with the, um, was the chairman of the board of an Italian American foundation. He really wanted to, to work for this foundation. He, he was Italian, but he didn't speak a word of Italian. And the job description for the open executive director role said, as an absolute requirement, fluency in Italian. At the end of the conversation with the board chair, the chair said, okay, we're reviewing the short list of candidates for this role uh, tomorrow, and I want you on the list. And he said, well, as I told you, I, I don't speak Italian. I, I really would like to learn. That's something that's one of my goals, but I saw that that's in the job description. So I don't care. You're the sort of person we want. I want you on that short list. So that's what happens when you focus on getting in a different way. You can still overcome some of that if you really engage someone, but it's harder. One technique you can you can um, you can employ is reframing. 
For example, in this case, the person said, well, you know, you don't have the certificate or degree that we're looking for. You know, I understand why you feel that way. In fact, you're not the first person I've talked to who's felt that way. But what I've found is I've been able to produce results like X, Y, Z. I have a track record of doing this, this, and this. And I found that that actually means more than the specific certification. So you're kind of acknowledging where they are, but you're providing an alternative way of looking at it. It's very important. The feel and the felt part is the acknowledgement that I hear you. I'm not just contradicting you. I'm saying, yeah, I understand what you're saying. And then the found part is where I'm making the case for why you might think of it differently. And it's really important that, you know, I am stuck in my thinking. And if you don't acknowledge it, it's not that you're agreeing that I'm right, that the fact that I, you know, that you don't have the certification is all is the problem. I'm just agreeing with the way you think about it. And then the person relaxes and they can listen a little bit. So it's your best shot at trying to deal with something like that. Alex, I think you were going to share something. Yes, you asked what is the biggest worries in the interview. First of all, people feel they are never prepared enough for these unknown questions. The answer is very simple, prepare. Another example that I see every day is, so why should I hire you versus other people? You really have to come up with a very, very good argument. And my last one would be, okay, uh, we need to wrap it up. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Okay, we, and we're actually, that last one we're going to hit directly. Um, yeah, and prepared. I, I, I have quoted you so many times to people about how, you know, you, you used to tell people that you should have, I forget what the number, you know, 10 hours of, of role play for before you ever have an interview because you don't want the interview for the job you really want to be your practice interview. Um, and you know, and the, the importance of practice, it's not even just getting the stories down. It's getting questions asked you different ways, things thrown at you different ways so that you, um, you get used to the unexpected because there's always going to be the unexpected. Yeah. What is one weakness you have? <laughs> yeah, that was, what is one weakness? Which I always, I always, you know, work with my, my clients on that question, even though it doesn't tend to come up that much, or it comes up in ways that we're not anticipating. But it is, it's a great question in terms of how you deal with it. If you go back to um, the very first season of The Apprentice, back when it was a really good show, um, and I think it was the either semifinal or quarterfinal episode where Bill Rancic, who went on to win it, was asked about his weaknesses. And he gave the traditional weakness that could really be perceived as a strength response. And, and the, uh, um, George, who was doing the interview, kind of laughed and said, yeah, I see what you're doing. But he got the job. It still worked, even though they both knew what he was doing. But the best way I found to answer the weakness question is that first, I'm not going to make it seem easy. I'm not going to sit there, oh, let me tell you all my weaknesses. I think about it for a minute. Well, if I had to, if I had to say a weakness, I guess what I would say. And then I'm going to make it sure it's something that's not core to this job. Because if it's if it's a job as a professional speaker, and I say that I'm afraid of being in front of an audience, I am out of the out of the running. So I make sure it's not core. I make sure it's something that's real but also something that I've been working on, and I show the trajectory as to why it's not that big a weakness now and what I'm, always, what I'm doing to continue working on it. And I found that that's really effective. And then if the person says, okay, so what other weaknesses do you have? 
I'm not there to share a litany of weaknesses. I, I'm going to be prepared if I, I can't think of any. And if they press me more, I'm going to have a second one that's far less important than the first one in my back pocket I can pull out if I need to. And if they still press me, because sometimes this is just a test. In fact, most of the time, the purpose of the question is a test to see how you react to it, not because of they're really expecting you're going to give us a, a substantive weakness. But if they, if they continue to press, I'm going to say, no, I'm sorry, I'm really not here to talk about weaknesses. I'm here to talk about what I can do for you. Can we, can we talk about that? Because a lot of times they're just seeing, do I have the confidence to push back? If they're really going to just drill me over and over again about weaknesses, it's not the place I want to be, and I'm never going to succeed anyway. Yeah. Oh, and, and to Alex's point, why hire you versus anyone else? I mean, that is a critical question. You need to have your unique value proposition really well in mind. What is it that I that makes me unique from all the other, when I was an actuary, what makes me unique from all the other actuaries? When I was, if I'm a project manager, what is my unique value as a project manager? And it can't be that I manage projects well. I mean, that's a big deal. It's got to be something, the result I produce, that I have a track record of turning around troubled projects or something, you know, I, I've got to have statements in there that are going to make me stand out among the competition. And we will talk about, uh, th this also comes down, down to the question about telling me about yourself. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Hi, John. I, I agree with what you're saying about uh, the tell me about a weakness. It doesn't come up too often. Mm -hmm. But you know, if what what a employer is, is trying to do or a hiring manager is trying to do is get an understanding of how you're going to react in a situation that is very relevant, you know, for the role and in the environment you're working in. So often, if a situation like that would come up with me in an interview, I always you know flip it back. I talk about the uh, reality of what challenges are, such as you know influencing without authority. Then I go into uh, uh, success stories on how I've been able to achieve uh, projects or tasks where I didn't have a uh, direct authority. Mm -hmm. So I demonstrate the fact this is that this is a reality. You know what you know what the role is is that if you're having to work in cross-functional teams, assemble a project team where they're not directly reporting to you, you have to be able to uh, you know, have the skills in uh, building uh, relationships and having the uh, competence in leading the team. That is all without authority. So when you're able to do that in a manner that demonstrates to the hiring manager, you know, what my strategy is is that I want them to picture me in the role, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as how I will perform once I, you know, uh, um, do whatever I, you know, need to do to demonstrate that I'm the right candidate. But I also want to step back. Because when you're talking about what worries you in interviews, you got to think more strategically than that. Because you're going to meet with a screen. So in, initially, the interview doesn't even begin until you can qualify your um, your skills and experiences that you're qualified for the position. Job screener is looking at, uh, at a lens from two angles. Are you qualified and what makes you qualified? And if you're not, we're going to disqualify you because we got a list of candidates that we need to do our shortlist. So the interview process begins with the uh, screen. There is so much information at, at your fingertips. LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. You know who you're going to be meeting with in a uh, job screening uh, situation. Look them up, find out where they went to school, what they do, who are their contacts. Mm -hmm. Then you're able to establish that dialogue, that right. conversation. It, so it's not that you're in an interrogation where you're being rapid fired. You want to be able to pivot the uh, into a dialogue and a conversation where you're asking questions, and it's demonstrating that you're you have the knowledge and the mm -hmm. ability to get you to that next uh, stage in the process. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And, and what you said about getting someone to picture you on the job, very critical. This it's a great technique. You know, you don't necessarily need to do it in the first five minutes of the interview, but it's at some point, it's very powerful to turn the conversation to, so suppose you hired me, 
what would you look for me to accomplish in the first six months on the job? And then stay in that person. Okay, so now what do you want from me now? And, and talk as if you are in the job, getting them to picture you sitting there doing that role. Because that, that kind of changes the way I look at you as opposed to this abstraction of what we're trying to accomplish and is this person the one who might be able to accomplish it? And what you said about success stories. I mean, absolutely every single question, I don't care what question you are asked in the interview, you should have a success story or part of a success story, some result that you can bring into your answer. Don't just say, you know, they say, what are your strengths? Don't just say, well, my strengths are that um, I'm a good people person. I'm good at, uh, you know, helping people find their full potential. Give me a concrete example that demonstrates that strength. Because when you say, when you just say, I'm, I'm a good project manager, or I have a track record, whatever, that's just words. I, it doesn't separate you from the pack. Your stories are what separate you. Your stories are what distinguish you from everyone else because your stories are you. And that's, and those are what are real. Those are when I hear, oh, now I understand how he does this. Um, and I start to believe more. So let's move into the template. So I like to break the interview down into five stages. The homework, the opening, the middle, the end, and the resale. Now the O, M, and E are the in-person or Zoom where I'm actually live with someone. So let's, we'll dispense with the other two quickly and then get back to the in-person part. So the homework stage, this is all about preparation that leads to confidence. If you don't walk into an interview with quiet confidence, you're not going to impress. This doesn't mean you have to be the person who jumps up on the table and shouts, I'm the best thing since sliced bread. This means you have to come in with this quiet confidence that there's a reason you invited me in. There's a reason you should be interested in talking to me. And so the more preparation you do, the more you look up the interviewers and understand their backgrounds, the more you research the company, the better prepared you are. So there's all the general preparation you do, you know, making sure your resume is a really strong sales brochure, that your cover letters are real marketing letters, that uh, your LinkedIn profile is very sharp, and that I get the same picture of you when I look at your LinkedIn profile that I do when I talk to you in person, that your marketing message is sharp, that you've got all your stories lined up, that you've thought about your answers to common questions. And then for any particular interview, you're going to do much more specific preparation. You can get into researching the company, the opening, the interviewers. You're going to look up press releases. You're going to find out everything you can about their the, the products and their competition, at least for the, the operation that you're going to be interviewing for. You're going to think about the specific questions and answers for this particular interview. What would they most be interested in? What are the stories that I want to make sure that I bring up? You should have like, say, three to five stories that you think are really relevant to this particular interview, this particular interviewer that you're going to bring up. And by the way, in the, you know, when you have the screening interview, you have the hiring manager, you have the uh, person over the hiring manager, they all have different concerns. So you want stories, you want approaches that deal with their concerns. The screener is not just concerned with your credentials. They're, there's a certain aspect of that they're concerned with, but they're also concerned, particularly if it's an HR person, they're concerned, how do you fit the organization? How do you fit our culture? Will we, you know, will p other people like working with you? So dealing with the, you can deal a lot more with questions related to the company culture and the people side of things with them. Um, now, on-site research used to be really important. I go to the interview, I look around. Um, I had a colleague who had a staffing firm, and he would always tell his his clients, "I want you to go. You want to. I want you to try try out the uh, commute. 
I want you to go before work one day. I want you to go during lunch one day. I want you to go at the end of the day one day and just watch people, see how they look going in and coming out. But things are changing. We're still coming back from Zoom. Um, com some companies are going back fully in person. Some are going hybrid. Some are staying remote. And it's going to continue to evolve. So don't take what you see today, unless a company is already fully back or say hybrid with four days in the office, any other situation, assume it's very likely it's going to change. So don't take what you see as definite, definitely illust illustrative of what you will see six months or a year from now. But I have a friend who uh, just as a pandemic was starting, he interviewed for a fully remote role for a company in Texas. He's doing great. He's leading a large unit. He's, he's still with them. But they have now announced that they are going to hybrid starting January 1, where hybrid means on site four days a week. He's grandfathered, so he can stay remote for now. But if he changes jobs, that goes away, and he suddenly will have to move to Texas. And uh, one of his close colleagues there is all set that, yeah, I'm, I'm out of here by January 1st because I do not want to be um, in that situation. He, he's really, he, he resisted remote. And then once he got used to it, he and his wife loved the flexibility it gave. And he said, there's no way I'm giving this up. And this is a, a, very, a fairly senior person who they're going to they're gonna lose a very good person when, when that happens. So don't take what you see on site as more than like a little bit of a guide of culture, not, not what you're going to see long term. And of course, you're going to concern yourself with your clothes, your hair, your professional appearance. And since a lot of interviews are still going to be remote, think about everything to do with Zoom. Make sure or go to meeting or practice different platforms. Make sure you've got good lighting. Make sure you've got a professional background. Don't use um, a virtual background in, if you can possibly avoid it, because you know there'll be a little fuzziness around your head or your fingers will disappear when you move. Um, you just won't look as good. Unless you have an incredibly high quality internet connection, maybe you can, you can do it. Or you have no place you can go to where you have a professional background, which again, if you have no place you can go with a professional background, that might be saying something about you. So you want to do everything you can to make sure that your, your video presence is high quality. And it's not just because I want to perform in the interview. It's because every job is going to have some degree of remote or hybrid. You're probably going to have lots of Zoom meetings. And the interviewer is experiencing what it's going to be like to work with you when you are remote, when we are having a Zoom meeting. So if you have bad lighting, if you have bad connection quality, all these different things are going through their mind that that's what it's going to be like dealing with this person every day on the job, too. And, and by the way, um, to the, the point about, like, when things go wrong, well, technology, things do go wrong all the time. And we get worried about, well, what if you know, I lose the call? What if the, tech, what if the connection goes down? Actually, sometimes that can be one of the best things that happens to you because of the way you deal with it and recover. Because as an interviewer, I'm getting to see how you react when something goes wrong. And if your reaction is, Oh shit! The, the this went down, and I don't know what to do. And oh, what I hate this system. You have just blown the interview. If your response is, "Oh, I'm sorry, let me fix this," and you come back quickly, I'm like hmm, deals with things with poise. This might be a good person to work with. So then the resale was is after the interview. This is about keeping the interviewer excited. Now we've had this good interview. I want to make sure that you're still excited about hiring me. So, you know, you send a thank you, but don't think of it as a thank you. Think of it again as a marketing letter. This is a sales piece to remind you why I am a good candidate, why you should be interested in hiring me. 
Oh, excuse me, John. Yeah. There's one question from a couple of minutes ago. Okay. What about what you might see on Glassdoor? So I think this is still the homework thing. Well, Glassdoor, it, it's a great research tool, but you do have to be a little careful because there are, what tends to happen is a lot of people who are disaffected employees will post really negative stuff there. Now, if I see lots of really negative stuff there about this company, there's something to that. But I have to take what I'm, what I'm seeing and reading with a grain of salt because I know that there's a tendency for there to be more negative there. Uh, so I might try to um, temper that with how can I talk to some people who actually work there? How can I talk to people who used to work there? Um, and sometimes that can be a really good tool. I, re I find someone on LinkedIn who used to work at the company there and I say, hey, you know, I'm in the interview process for company X and I know you used to work there. I'd love to chat with you and get your perspective. They're a little more likely to be willing to do that than the person who's already there who I don't have a relationship with yet. Um, again, I still have to take a little grain of salt. I have to find why they're not there. What happened? Is it is it something that there's... Um, bad feeling that this, that I'm, again, getting a negative reaction due to a personality issue, but I can get a lot more real. I can, I can ask some deeper questions about the experience in the company and what did they like about it, what didn't they, and that sort of thing. Um, so, so the resale, this is really about if we've had a good interview, I want to keep you excited. I want to demonstrate my professionalism. I want to demonstrate my passion, my proactivity. I want to have a keep in touch strategy to stay in touch with this interviewer because the process may get drawn out. Most times it does get drawn out. Um, I had someone who, uh, you know, I had a, a package I, I used to put out on selling your achievements and and one of the pieces in the package, when it was talking about cover letters and thank you letters, one of them was a, um, why not just hire me now letter? Well, he'd been going through a process where um, he, he kept getting delayed. And so he wrote a, why not just hire me now letter to the hiring manager. And the next day, the hiring manager reached out with the offer and said, you know, that's what put you over the top because I really like the style. I like the argument you made. So when you do the right keep in touch strategy, it really changes the game in terms of the likelihood because I get a chance to show qualities that might be important to this interviewer. Uh, and of course, prep your references. Nothing bugs me more than getting a call from someone for a reference and the person who I'm providing the reference for hasn't let me know this might happen. How can I do a good job? If I don't know what you're interviewing for, if I don't know why you think you're a good person, fit for the job, if, I, if, if I'm surprised and caught out of the blue, how can I do the best job as your reference? So make sure every, if you have references, every time that you are in an interview situation that might lead to a reference check, call your reference. Call each one of them. Tell them what you're interviewing for, why you think you're great, what they're looking for. Be, you know, get them prepared. Sometimes what ha I've, I've had this happen to myself where uh, when I did that person, oh, I know someone at that company. Let me give them a call. So, uh, but I want the, they should be my eyes and ears in the market. There's so much more to, you know, we could get into more about references. There's, there's so much more than them just serving as a reference for you. So let's go back to the inter, oh, and by the way, there are two other, two other resale points that once I get the offer, I resell myself at that stage. And then once I've accepted the offer, there's a whole resale I want to do before I even start at the company to show them how excited I am and to make sure that I'm hitting the ground running from day one. So now let's go back to the interview. And we'll, we'll deal with the end first because that's pretty simple and we'll work our way back from there. So what I'd love to do is get someone 
to come up and do a mini role play with me about the end of the interview. So who would like to who would like to come up? Or we can always get someone on on the uh, remote end of things if uh, if no one has the temerity to come up in person. Remember, this is this, you don't want to be watching the exercise class. You don't build your muscles by watching. You build your muscles by doing. Okay, great. So, uh, David, where should she stand for people to be able to see or hear her? Should she just do it at the mic or? Like, yeah, the microphone is good. Okay, got it. Do you want to help me? <laughs> I think I'll help you at the end of the interview. Want to give you the answers? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Patty, the, so the setup here is that we've already had a really good interview. You feel good about how you did. You've asked me lots of questions throughout. You feel like you've gotten all the all the answers you're looking for. And so we get to this last couple of minutes, and I say, so Patty, do you have any other questions for me? Uh, yes, I do, John. Um, is there anything that I said during the interview that would that that would you know? allow you not to hire me oh wow yeah I mean there's there there are at least five or six things so what what happened what happened you know, I'm, I'm being facetious obviously so what happened here it gave her an opportunity to you went negative you get you you encouraged me to go negative and criticize your interview so try Try asking the same question, but in a positive way. Think of a way you can ask that that doesn't invite me to go negative. What things have we said during the interview that would allow you to hire me? Okay, that's that's getting there. Here's a way I, I, I would like, you know, obviously, use your own language, but one way to say is, look, what else could I tell you that would convince you I'm the person you'd want to hire for this job? So just try to answer, ask it, but ask it in a very positive way. But you did the, but it is the right thing. You need to find out how you did, because you may think you did really well. I may be very guarded, and I just I smile a lot, and I just don't tell you how you did, and you won't get past that unless you ask. So that's so that's the first thing. Okay. So you asked me. I said, oh, uh, no. Um, no, I can't think of anything. I think you, you did it. You're a really credible candidate for this job. Okay, so what are the critical skills needed that I would need um, to do this job? So I'm asking you. Well, let's assume that you've done that early okay. on. I, I'm gonna, let's assume you've really got, dug into that because that is really important. And if you got to that at the very end, I'd be like, well, yeah, that, weren't you listening early? Right. You didn't. You didn't ask me those questions. Yeah. Okay. So what else do you want to know other than you, you you find out that you did well, what else do you want to know? What would I be doing the first, say, say Okay, so again, think, you already assume you've already found out everything you possibly could about the job, the challenges, the goals. What else do you need to know before you leave this, this interview? When will you be making a decision, John, on this particular role? Uh, well, we have two other candidates that we're looking at. We expect to wrap things up by the end of next week. Okay. Can we look at our calendars and can I schedule some time on your calendar just to follow up on Friday um, of next week so that you know we just can, can talk? Um, now, uh, we will get back to you when the time is appropriate. Okay, great. Okay. What you did, you're 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 heading to the right thing, but you didn't do it in a very confident way. So so it would it's kind of like yeah. And you asked me if you could do this. Be really confident. Just say okay, great. So I will plan to call you a week from Monday if I haven't heard from you by then. And now you now you look really confident. And you're marking your calendar. Now, I might still say, no, um, call HR, or we'll be in touch with you, or whatever. But you try. You, you've at least shown that some leadership and some confidence in what you've done. Um, you've found out the timeline, which is really critical. Um, 
And what happens is now if, if I say, okay, you're able to mark your calendar for a week from Monday and forget about it. You're not, you don't get to next Friday, you know, like, I haven't heard from them, what am I going to hear from them, what's going on, I'm, and you start this cycle that, that impairs your, your own psychology. And then you get an opportunity a week from Monday, in fact, it's, it's in many ways, it's good if you haven't heard, because you get to call me up a week from Monday and say, John, um, this is Patty, I'm following up on the project manager role we discussed, I'm still very interested. And I'd love to check on where we stand. I will plan to follow up with you again on Wednesday if I haven't heard from you by then. And I get this message. I'm like, oh, huh, I like her style. She follows through. She does what she says she's going to do when she's going to do it. And so you've just demonstrated actively a quality that might make it more likely that I decide to hire you. There's one other thing that you want to do in the, in the end of the interview, um, which is, you want to make absolute, you want to leave no question in my mind that you're interested, assuming you are. Yeah. You're not saying, I'm going to take the job no matter how much you lowball me. You're, you're, you're expressing strong interest because if Alex interviews for the job and you interview for the job, and I am absolutely convinced Alex will take the offer if I make it to him. And you, I'm just, I have no idea. I'm not sure if you're interested or not. And you're close in, in my mind as to um, a hiring decision. I'm gonna hire Alex every single time because I do not wanna go through the effort of coming up with an offer, getting my boss on board, going through the HR rigmarole and making you the offer, have you turn it down. So, so John, so, I really want this job. I think I, I know I will do an excellent job for you, and I, I'll call you next week. Sure. Or, I need or, or, or even in the, in the, you can even weave it into what you did in asking me what else you could tell me. You could say, look, I am so excited. This job, I think I could do the job because I can bring X, Y, and Z to the table. Is there anything else I could tell you? that would convince you I'm the person you want to hire. So, but anywhere in that process, somewhere making it very clear that you are very interested in the role, it improves your odds. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. So that's the end of the interview. Um, in fact, actually, I, I, I had someone I was working with who he had a panel interview um, and it went really well. There was a lot of humor in the room. And so um, when he got to the end, they asked him, do you have any other questions? He said, yeah, I just have one. When do I start? And he started the next Monday. So let's go back to the opening of the interview. The opening is its just this short bit at the beginning, and it's all about creating a strong first impression. So what you're trying to do is build rapport and draw a picture. And what I mean by this is, you know, think about when you walk into an interview. Who's, who's tense walking into an interview? Well, we all are because we're interviewing and we want the job, but the interviewer is too. You know, I, I did all the hiring for my, all the actuarial hiring for my company for 13 years. And I, I got good at it. I enjoyed it, but I still every single time, oh, I hope Alex is the, is the one because I'm tired of interviewing. I just want someone to get the job done. I want, to, I want to go back to getting things done. I don't want to be spending all this time trying to hire someone. So I am tense too. And I am trying as the interviewer to draw this picture of you and are you the person I might want. So you're, this is your chance to draw your own picture for me and reduce my tension. That I say, oh, now I, now I understand what it is Alex brings to the table. I have an idea. Now I may not, it may not fit 100% what I thought I was looking for, but I'm, I'm relaxed. I'm like, okay, now let's see if we can kind of fill in the eyeshadow and different things to, to complete the picture instead of me spending as the interviewer the first 15 minutes trying to draw the picture and coming up with one that wasn't what you were hoping I would get. So this is your opening salvo. This is your chance to draw that picture. So 
who would like to do a little role play about the opening of the interview? Well, I really intimidated people with what I said we were going to do that. Don't worry, it's 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 not going to be. Um, I'm not going to bite your head it's off. It's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tend to be a, an encouraging person, so who would like to try? Otherwise, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make Anthony uh, call on someone. Okay, so, um, all right, so let's, let's start, Bruce. So, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm late. I had to take the cat to the vet. Um, so uh, where was where were we? Jeez. Uh, um, okay. Well, you know, well, you know, oh, I don't know. Uh, it's really a sad situation. The cat's been going downhill over the last few weeks, and I'm hoping I'm hoping it'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Bruce passed the test. And actually, three quarters of the time I do this, no one asks about the cat. You are looking for a chance to build rapport for, with this person. And what, I, what I get all the time is people saying, well, I didn't know if it was appropriate. Um, maybe they don't want to talk about the cat. Oh, this is a professional situation. This is a personal relationship you're building with someone. So just as simple as asking how the cat is, is so powerful. I might say, well, I don't really want to talk about that and we move on, but I'll, I'll, I'll know that you're human. We've, we've, it's, it's connected. And a lot of times it'll lead to more discussion. You're going to somewhere emotional that's important to me. So that was great. Okay, so let's, so let's start up. Okay. So Bruce, um, why don't you tell me, why are you here? Oh, I'm here. I'm uh... Yeah, I'm an IT business analyst, and uh, oh, IT oh, excuse me a second. What? What? I won't worry. I'll get rid of it. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, Ben. Um, you know, in in that role, it appears to be about what you're looking for. Okay. Any thoughts from anyone? Suppose, uh, you know, I'm going in for an interview. I, I've said, you know, I'm tired of being. Um, an independent career coach, having to build my practice one person at a time. After two decades, I, I, I'm tired. I just want to go back into the corporate world. I want to be an executive coach inside a Fortune 100 company. So how might I tell my story to engage them for that? So, um, and, and by the way, as you hear stories, Think about these statements as you as you practice your story with other people. Think about does does it hit these marks? Because that that'll help you get your story more more effective. So so let's say I'm I'm in an interview with the head of talent acquisition for you know to work for them as a, as an executive coach. So. I'm an expert at helping unlock people's self-marketing skills so that they can find new opportunities. I graduated from Stanford with a degree in math and economics, and I went into the actuarial field where I got to rotate uh, through all different roles, ultimately as the disability product manager, but I worked in all different functional areas as an actuary um, at Equitable. And one project that I loved was when I was given the chance to figure out how we could apply industrial engineering techniques to measure productivity in a financial services firm, which back in the 70s was not being done. And the result was that um, every person in the 150 person department I was in won a $3,000 bonus because we won the first ever corporate wide productivity improvement contest. I then was recruited by uh, Commercial Life to build an actuarial department from scratch. So for the next 13 years, I did all the hiring, recruiting, coaching, staff development, um, building this, this group. 
And along the way, I was given charge of a unit that was not an actuarial group. It was our compliance operation. They basically were a totally just demoralized operation. They had a manager who had pretty much retired on the job. And I was able to go in and figure out how to reorganize what they did, re-engage them, got them to where they were producing 60% more projects with no increase in headcount. And now they, they love their jobs. They were really excited. They were recognized as one of the most productive operations in the company. Uh, I then decided I'd had enough of corporate life and I opened a consulting practice and earned over two and a half million dollars in revenues. But along the way, I discovered this passion for self-marketing. And so I, two decades ago, I opened my career coaching practice and I've helped hundreds of people land the jobs and pay they deserve. Now I'm ready for my next challenge. And I believe what I bring to the table is that I really understand all of all the areas of the corporate world, how the functions fit together. I've worked in so many different ones. I understand how to motivate people, how to engage them, how to create really powerful teams. And that's what I'd like to bring to your operation. I'd love to be helping your executives and budding executives become and be seen as influential leaders. So what I've done is I've drawn a picture of what I might bring to the table. You notice I was an actuary for 20 years. How much actuarial work did I talk about? Yeah, zero. I didn't hide that I was an actuary, but what I did was I talked about the things as an actuary that I did that might be relevant to this coaching role at a company. And, you know, I went back all the way to college. You don't, you don't have to, you do what, what's important, but why do you think I went back all the way to college? Stanford. Stanford. It has a cachet. And I recognize that. So I'm always going to use that in my story uh, just because of that. If I went to Podunk U, I wouldn't bother because it, 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 I wouldn't need to go all the way back like that. So you use what's relevant and what will get this person excited about you might be the person I want for this role. You might, you have key and, and, You didn't touch it, don't worry. Like the, the fact that the productivity improvement contest of one everyone bonuses, like reorganizing that operation and getting them more efficient and, and engaged, you know, results that would be relevant to this new job. That and if I do that, now I've set the stage really well for the rest of the interview. So um by the way, David, how how I how long do you want me when do, yeah, I can cut at any time and go to Q and A. What would what would you like? Um, we've got several more minutes, so if you want to do a couple more role yeah, plays, maybe till eleven thirty ish or so. Okay, so let's go to the middle of the interview. You know, the opening. There, you know, you're trying to make sure. You know, how do I find this connection? How do I build this picture that that draws uh, starts things off from a, a really strong place? Um, and the end, you know what you need to do at the end, but then there's the middle. And I had a client who kept asking me, what's, what's the script? What do I do in the middle of it? And um, I, what I kept saying to him was, there is no, it's, there is nothing. You finally say, oh yeah, it's jazz. You got to improvise. You got to respond to what's going on. You've got to continually react to what the interviewer is saying and doing, and it's going to be, it's going to come at you in a different order. It's going to come at you different ways than you anticipated. They're going to go down a rabbit hole you never anticipated, which is why, as Alex was saying, you got to do a lot of practice. The more practice you do, and particularly with someone who's going to explore those different things and take you down rabbit holes that you didn't anticipate and ask you questions different ways, the better prepared you are to deal with anything that happens in the interview. But the core of the, the interview, the core of the middle, is that you are trying to turn this into a conversation. You're trying to make this something where I like you, we're talking, you're asking good questions, we're having this real engagement, 
um, and that you are finding out what the challenges are. That is the core of the interview. If you spend all your time talking about your qualifications, talking about your credentials, giving me some examples of things you brought to the table, but you don't find out what my deep underlying challenges are, you're not getting the job because the hiring decision is down at those deep underlying challenges, the things that are keeping me up at night. Your job in the interview Do you hear us now, remote people? Yes. Hmm. Okay. At least one did. The camera changed. Okay. So hopefully that's the last of the gremlins, and we will be good to go. Try this again. And don't worry, John is here all week, so you can come in anytime you want and pick up the parts that you uh, missed. Duplicate. Okay, so John is going to do some role playing. Hopefully, you guys remotely can hear us. And um, uh, then when this is all over, I think Nora's going to take me out back and beat you. <laughs> and me for bringing a, a laptop without a power source. And I'll just stick that up on the screen in the meanwhile. So, um, so uh, we're doing the middle of the interview. What I want you to think about is what question could you ask? What, what could you ask me that starts to get into the challenges that, were, that are involved? And what, tell me, what sort of job are you applying for? Uh, compliance training manager. Compliance training manager, okay. So, uh, 
So I, you know, uh, I've, I've heard a lot about you. What, you know, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, thank you, John, for the opportunity to meet with you. And uh, what, what I really uh, keyed in on was to say, you were talking about what challenges that are presented with the compliance program. And the, uh, the goal in being able to- why, why you back up, assuming that I haven't shared that yet, and you're trying to get to that. Okay. So what I recognize having uh, previous experience with other pharmaceutical companies, an effective compliance program begins a, 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 an effective successful uh, program begins with a top-down strategy. Can you describe on how your compliance program here and does it really give the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the prevalence of executive leadership that endorses an effective compliance program? I, I think it does. In what, in what ways it, uh, does, it, or does your executive leadership uh, uh, um, demonstrate that the critical importance of compliance and, and how that we are in a very highly uh, regulated industry that uh, it's mission critical to have an effective compliance program? So what, what, met, what methodology is uh, undertaken to uh, uh, demonstrate the integrity from the uh, leadership? Well, um, you've 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 seen the bio of our 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 CEO. I mean, he clearly is someone who has great integrity. And you've seen our mission statement. I mean, it, it talk, every statement in that talks about integrity, meeting all the regulatory guidelines. I I think that says it all. Yeah, I I, I, I agree that uh, it's important. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, I'm not making it easy for you. Actually, what you said at the very beginning, the thing from my experience in pharmaceutical, really that that was a great start. If you if you said from my experience in the pharmaceutical world, compliance areas usually have one of these problems, and you laid out like say two or three problems. Do you have problems in any of those areas? That would be a really powerful way to start. It would get because it would show your that you have a lot of knowledge in this and it would get us to what problems we're facing. The high level of integrity, and I, I don't know that I would, uh, one, I wouldn't probably admit to whether we, we have integrity or not if we don't, um, and, I, and it's just so high level. You wanna to get to what are the real challenges we face in our compliance and training unit. Um, so, so one way would be, well, I, like, I, I can give you an example. Sure, go ahead. Because I, I really uh, targeted you know, what was relevant in the industry. With the latest, uh, most recent update to the Pharma Code, um, one of the most significant uh, and, and uh, really uh, a powerful message that the, our governing uh, regulatory bodies, the uh, OIG, the Office of the Inspector General, and um, the uh, FDA, is just that they're challenging the legitimacy of speaker programs. In uh, my past experience working with uh, companies, what we did is that we really uh, taken to heart the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, update to the speaker program and looked at our own existing speaker program policy to see where, if there were deficits that we needed to uh, sharpen. One of the things that we recognized is that it wasn't clearly articulated. The okay, let, let me pause. Yeah. You are spending a lot of time telling me stuff and telling me stuff that if I'm in the in business, I already know. Yeah. So you got you to sharpen this. Look, at my last company, here's the issue we faced and here's how we dealt with it. Can I ask you, how are you dealing with it here at your company? Okay. That, now, now you're with yeah. me. Sure. You know, don't yeah. work so hard to set things up. Right. Get, get to what you're trying to get at, us, at um, quickly. Um, really good way to get at this at, at challenges, yeah. like, well, the example I was giving you a minute ago, but also just asking, so suppose you hired me. What would you look for me to accomplish in the first six months on the job? And then that can set things up that, great, what do you see as the biggest obstacles that I'm gonna have to overcome to get there? 
And now we're starting to talk about the challenges and then you can keep digging deeper and deeper into what those are and why they're problems, how they show up in the business, et cetera. Perfect. But thanks, thanks for coming up again. So as I was uh, mentioning, I told you at the beginning, if you're interested in career tips, there was a sheet going around here and those yeah. online. If you just, you can put tips in the box and David will tell me who it is, or you can send me an email. And anyone who signs up for career tips, it's a free newsletter um, on how to market yourself effectively. I will, I'll send you that building influence series as well. If you're already getting my, my career tips and you just want the building influence, that's fine. Just I'll look, you, I'll look up and make sure that I'm not duplicating. Um, and if you're really struggling, um, I don't have time to do everyone in the room, but I'd be happy to schedule up to five kickstart your career search sessions to explore what challenges you're facing, what's going on, and, and position you to take action. You know, if, there, if there's a fit, I'll explain how we could work together on that, but it's, there's no obligation. So that's what I wanted to share. John, thank you very much. You're welcome. Not shaking your hands, but yeah. I'm That's for you. Mm -hmm. Oops, take my mask off. I'm wearing my mask today, folks, because I have a cold, and I guess I'm just in preventative mode. So just that's exactly why. So for those of you online, we apologize for the uh, very rare and unexpected technical glitch that we had. Uh, the good news is, and, and we think this is terrific news, is that we are actually soon going to be migrating to only in-person. Uh, vir virtual and, and hybrid have been very effective for us for a long time, but uh, we think it's time for us to be only in-person, so that will be beginning on Bastille Day. On July 14th, we will be in-person, keeping the group going. We were always in-person since 2012 here, when we first were at the library. And we're looking forward to that. So look forward. And we have a big group here today, so that's kind of nice. So will you have a, an Aloha shirt that celebrates Bastille Day? Every uh, Aloha yeah. shirt celebrates every holiday. You've got Aloha shirts, yeah. you know. Sometimes John does visit us with his Aloha shirt. And I'm hoping uh, uh, Alex will buy one one day soon. <laughs> uh, we'll see. No, no, okay. Maybe in Monica's closet. I need permission oh. from my wife. Oh, okay. <laughs> Keep one in your car, and, wow. and then when you get here, you go in the restroom, you change the shirt, and then when it's over, you change back, and no one will ever know except our secret. And if she finds out, then what? I will not tell her. Well, no pictures then. <laughs> right, we'll, we'll be live, right? There'll be no virtual, so not to worry about. We'll, we'll put a big smiley face on your on your head on the video, so she doesn't know. But these were really powerful tips, especially for those of you who had the opportunity to a role play with John and see how you can make your um, Q&A much more efficient and effective. And so it's a good idea if you can to practice interviewing, whether you work with a coach or you work with someone uh, that you trust. And by the way, when you work on interviewing with someone that you trust, a friend or not, it can't be your best friend. It can't be somebody at home, a spouse or partner. They love you the way you are. They can't be as objective. Maybe someone you used to work with, a peer, who knows your industry. And don't be afraid to ask, can you just help me for a little bit? And if you need to, you buy the cup of coffee uh, to get them to show up, no worries. So, but uh, practice, uh, practice makes perfect. And so I think that's really what was uh, a takeaway from here is uh, ways to be more efficient. And uh, we will continue to be back here, of course. We will be back here next week. Let me just get my outline up, there it is. And so uh, Alex, unfortunately for us, but fortunately for you, uh, you do not have to wear your Aloha shirt next week uh, because you will be virtual and Monica, if she watches the video next week, will uh, you'll be busted. So we can't allow that. But Alex Freund, we are so pleased, will be back with us uh, in here instead of the seat there. And uh, May 12th, Alex will be here branding for landing, how to promote yourself in a way that gets you not only noticed, but puts you in a positive light for landing that next position as well. So Alex will be here, always a good friend and supporter uh, for his 204th presentation to PSG or something like that. I don't know. And um, the following week, uh, May 19th, <coughs> excuse me, Lisa Manioki will be here, networking success strategies in a virtual world. And she is just powerful online, has a tremendous amount of information. And she'll be talking about, since there's so much virtual networking and virtual interviewing and such, 
uh, networking success strategy. So that's what we have coming for the next two weeks, May 12th and 19th. Uh, also, if you're interested, there are other groups, friends of ours that we like to let you know about. Um, May 13th, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey will be meeting and Ken Share will be talking about to survive and thrive after a job loss. So uh, that's a very important presentation. He is a coach as well. And New Jersey Job Seekers will be meeting this Tuesday and I will be posting the connection info. It's too long and complicated of a link to tell you, but I'll be posting that in our LinkedIn group. So look for it in the discussion there. And of course our cousin organizations, PSG of Morris County, PSGMC.org meets Wednesdays at 9.30 and PSG of Central New Jersey, PSGCNJ.biz meets Mondays at 10.30. And for anyone who wants more information about PSG of Central New Jersey, Charlie is in the back and he can give you all that information. Uh, so uh, come uh, speak to Charlie if you'd like. So until we get to see you uh, next, week, next week, whether virtually or in person, uh, we'll simply say, bye everybody.